by golly. Well, hello there, good people. Hi, I'm Jason with Green Country. I'm Jason with Green Country. <laughs> we'll edit that in post. No, we won't. Hi, everybody. I'm Jason with Green Country Agroforestry. It's Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. And that means it's time for yet another live stream. Tonight, we've got a great topic. Of course, if you saw the, the thumbnail, you're going to be scratching your head going, what in the world is all this about? Well, I got a call earlier this week, and that's what that little thumbnail is about. I got a call inviting me to come and present for the Muskegee Nation or the Creek Nation uh, Tribal Natural Resources Council. And the, the objective is to, to, to talk to school kids that are that are that are in the tribe and uh, tell them about careers and uh, natural resources like agroforestry uh, and areas that we might need additional education and research in if they're interested in pursuing doctorates or degrees and things like that. And of course, I'm absolutely excited at the possibility. Pardon me, as I spray water everywhere. <laughs> I'm absolutely excited at the possibility of going and, and, and helping talk to kids about about this sort of work. I could tell them about how I've started out and and and, and begun building a business out of out of home, uh, mostly part time, and have have begun to work it up into something that's actually generating income. And how, of course, if you were a school child, uh, perhaps in grade school, you could start even at that young age and with the the land around your own home, you can generate income to the point where by the time you're ready to leave school, you already have your career set. Um, great career path for young people to get get in, especially because some of these things like, you know, countries, they do take a long time to grow, 15 years before they really start producing much of anything. And pardon me, I have got, I have got a sniffy nose today. Uh, might be related to having inhaled a bunch of water and just had a, a horrible coughing fit right before we went live. The kids came walking in from feeding the animals, and I was just coughing and choking. And they said, "Are you okay?" I was like, "Yeah, I just I <gasps> and <coughs> ah yeah anyway." Hmm. Oh, Vicky says Seth Pulser started his career as a child. In a way, I kind of did too, with a, with a little a little Red Rider wagon full of uh, full of potted plants and seeds, and I just didn't have the right I just didn't have the right market to sell to back then. All right, so I got think got to thinking about this. First off, yeah, I really want to do it, but what would I what would I say? What kind of lessons would I teach? Um, and and the thought occurred to you that maybe I could start with a story. And a tradition that's been lost over time, especially for, for, for those, those of us with a lot of Western heritage and a lot of Western culture, what we've lost over time is that tradition of passing on wisdom in the form of stories. We used to do it. We used to do it quite a bit, but we've kind of fallen out of the habit. Now our stories are sort of mass produced and commercial, but they don't really teach us much of anything. At least not anything that we need to know. <clears throat> so I thought about traditional indigenous stories. And one in particular that I've always found interesting because it's, it is the oldest story. And nearly every culture has some form of this story or their parent culture has some form of the story because it goes back at least 100,000 years in the human's past, in, in the human history. More recently, the most recent form of the story is about 14,000 years old. The oldest form is about 100,000 years. But so that gives us an idea of the range, the deep range of time that this story has been around. <clears throat> Vicky says, remind me to not try using a neti pot. Okay, <laughs> don't try using a neti pot. Guys, I, I may have to duck off screen for a moment here and make some horrific noises um, <clears throat> if, this, if this continues. Just saying. I was not anticipating having a nose running while I was trying to talk to you tonight. <clears throat> so here we go. Let me share with you the uh, the screen that I have open, which is, of course, a tale of seven sisters, which I have put up on our blog at Green Country Agroforestry. 
All right, and let me go control. What am I doing? Okay, that's better. StreamYard changed some things up on me, guys. <laughs> so I have this nice little picture that I found for this. It's a stock picture, but it has some 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 of those sunflowers in the front. Some uh, maybe those are California poppy over there to the side, or maybe it's regular poppy bars. Hard to tell from here. But the Pleiades star cluster is in the background. The moon is rising. It's really it's really kind of surrealistic. I liked that picture. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and get started for you. <clears throat> if I can not choke. Here we go. We'll just do it this way. There's the screen. You can't see what I'm doing. Thanks. <laughs> okay. All right. We got our text up there so that you can read along with us. Uh, is it big enough? I don't know if it's big enough. Let me, uh, let me zoom in a little bit here. I've got a kitty on my lap. She wants to be part of the show, I guess. Zoom until I can see our lettering really, really big. All right. Now, how does that look on the screen for you guys? Is that pretty big? There we go. All right. <clears throat> so here we go. The important thing to know about stories is their proper use and purpose. And the proper use and purpose of our star stories is to tell us something about time, either about an event that occurred at a particular time or an annual event that we need to be mindful of. The tale that follows is not a cultural myth of any particular nation or even one continent, but an amalgamation of many stories regarding the constellation known as the Pleiades and how the time of their departure is significant to living with the land here in Oklahoma. I should also point out that this is a bottle gourd story and it's best told when preparing. Let me get this screen adjusted because you probably want to see me at this moment. It's best told while preparing bottle gourds, and I have one right here at the moment. Let me just go ahead and empty what's in it out. Well, this gourd has already been prepared, so I'm just going to pretend for a moment. You can pretend along with me that it still has some seeds in it. There we go. <clears throat> All right, now for props, when I'm telling this story... I need a few props, and the props that we're going to use are, I have them right here. Yeah, is it? Do I have all of them? I want to count and make sure we have them. Let me get this screen up here. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, somehow I went up with eight. We got one extra. This is not supposed to be that kind of a magic trick. But one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I got one extra. Let's get rid of. Let's get rid of uh, this one here. I don't need this one. All right. So I've got seven of these seashells here. All right. So we use this to tell the story while we clean out our bottle gourds. All right. <clears throat> so I should also point out this is a bottle gourd story, and it's best told while preparing. Dry gourds for use as containers. I use a set of seven seashells like this. I just told you about those. They become characters in the story as well. Now, once upon a time, long before I was a young person, which was a very long time ago indeed, there were seven sisters who lived up in the sky. And they were always together. Where one sister went, the others were bound to go. There was also a great giant who lived in the sky, and he kept a flock of beautiful white birds. Now, they just come into the story here because the sisters snuck into the giant's lair and took the feathers from those birds to make cloaks for themselves. Well, the giant found out about the theft and he quickly began to chase after the girls. If you look up in the sky in the winter, you can see six of those seven sisters in the sky wearing their white cloaks and following behind them is the giant. Some people call him Orion. Now, what happened to the seventh sister is one of the oldest stories I know. It dates back nearly a hundred thousand years in human history and it's been told by many many different cultures it involves a young man who in this version of the story will be named Ikea after the river came that grows by his home <clears throat> guys who are coming in late if you would like 
to uh, be able to watch the story under uninterrupted, go ahead and go back to the beginning. Begin watching from the beginning. You could always put it on fast forward, devil speed, whatever you want, so you can catch up with the rest of us. You probably don't want to miss the foundations of the story, uh, where I begin to tell you why we're telling stories in the first place. But in any case, if you're coming in late or you're watching on the replay, go ahead and hit that like button on the way in because you're probably going to like this one. Bobbleboard story. The story of Ikea. Here's a picture of River Cane here if you're following along. Do I have that set so you can see? No, I don't. Let me shift this over so you can see. Let's do a split screen like that. How's that work? All right. You can see me and you can see the screen. I can live with that. And there's a picture of some River Cane. We don't actually have any in our backyard right now. <coughs> we got some, but it's all, yeah. So there are the sisters on the run. Giant is chasing after them. But one can't run all the time. When the sisters grew tired of running for a while, they would come down to the ground and dance across the ponds, lakes, rivers, and streams, freezing them solid. It's very cold high up in the sky where the sisters live, you see. And that's why they make everything freeze. They're made of ice. Sometimes the sisters dancing will stir up the waters and make great clouds across the sky so that they can rest without the giant seeing them. On these occasions, they rest all across the landscape. They're resting on ponds and lakes, on rocks, on trees, and sometimes even on the, on the roofs of our homes. They look kind of like, well, this picture here. Resting. One evening, the sky had cleared early despite the maiden's efforts, and the moon was shining brightly overhead. A young man ventured out to have a look at all the brilliant whiteness reflecting the moonlight. And that's when he saw her. Now, I know that some of you reading or hearing the story might not believe that such a thing can happen yet. But in time, I'm sure you will. You see that special someone in the moonlight and your entire world changes forever. So it was with this young man. As he gazed upon the youngest of the sisters, he fell completely head over heels in love. <clears throat> Everyone here is relatively intelligent, so I don't have to tell you that one should always take care when walking in the woods after a snowfall. Aside from the pits and holes waiting to catch legs and break them, stepping on a branch is liable to produce a very audible crack, alerting everyone in the neighborhood to your presence. Ikea was an intelligent sort, but he was so completely captivated by what he saw that he neglected that moment of care and stepped upon a branch. Sound carries so much better in cold weather, as you and I both know all too well. And the maiden heard the noise and looked up to see its source, finding our hero. Ikea stood perfectly still, uncertain what to do. The maiden simply smiled at him and disappeared, going back into the sky again as the sun rose. Determined to be with the sky maiden, Ikea decided to seize her the very next time he laid eyes upon her and bring her back to his home. The very next year, he had his chance. Oh, <clears throat> pardon me. <clears throat> Sometime during this presentation, if I was cleaning the bottle gourd, I would have measured where I wanted to cut the top off, maybe with a piece of charcoal. And then we would have commenced using some sort of a, a punch all or maybe the point of a knife or even a flake of flint to begin cutting along that line. And I should have the top off by this point. But of course, we haven't been doing that because I've just been telling the story and I already had the top off. We've actually already got done all of this. We're just going, going to sort of go through the motions for you. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> now would probably be a good time to mention that there is such a thing as respecting personal boundaries and grabbing someone and dragging them back to your house is considered to be a violation by most. But as I say, he saw his chance to bring the star maiden home. And so he took her up in his arms and brought her back to his lodge. I'm sorry to say, I do not know what the star maiden's name was, but today we call that star Cleone. The maiden went with him, willingly, of course, and gave a gift of six white bulbs, one for each of her sisters. She had six sisters, because where each sister went, 
all the sisters would go. And she went into the lodge to stay with Ahia. Only at this point did Ahia discover that the maiden was made of only ice. When he tried to hold her, she melted away in his arms, leaving behind the six white bulbs. Ahia planted those bulbs by his door, and from them grew all of the garlic, leeks, shallots, scallions, onions, and chives. Now he is even more determined to take the star maiden to be his wife. He dug a deep pit into the side of a hill and built a timber frame within it of shipmast locust. He roofed the entire frame with locust wood and then went down to the ocean, as was the custom every year, to catch fish and gather sea salt. Before leaving the river where he had lived, he cut several lengths of the river cane and made a basket. Combing the beach with basket in hand, he picked up seven. Where did I put them? Seven. Are these things? One, two. Three, yes, seven, seven white seashells, one for each of the seven sisters, one for each of the seven sisters. He put those in the basket. Although I have also heard it said that with seven mounds of shells, one for each maiden. And there's a reason why this other version will make sense later on. On the beach, he found balls of black sticky stuff tar that had washed up on the beach, and he put those in the basket, too. Upon returning home, he began sealing the joints between the timbers with the tar, then added clay, then stone, and then earth, reversing the layers and returning the hill as it had been, but now with a cave inside of it. As the summer faded, he cut meadow grasses and lined the little burrow with dry grass, just like a field mass, mouse I can't pronounce this word, apparently. Just like a field mouse lines its den. See, I was reading this earlier, and I made the same mispronunciation. So apparently, I say mass whenever I say M-O-U-S-E for some reason. I don't know why. <clears throat> I also bit my tongue. That may have something to do with it. <laughs> Finally, Ikea arranged the seashell so that his love could see him from overhead and return to him when autumn returned once more. I would just... Maybe if I had more space, I'd lay these shells out and you'd see them see the shells in the pattern of the, the star group of the Pleiades. It's very pretty and all that wonderful stuff. But hey, we're we're getting ourselves sidetracked here. I'm holding a bunch of shells and a gourd and telling you about an illicit love story between a human man and a woman from the stars. Now I want you to remember, this was an intelligent man, and he reasoned that what would keep a mouse warm in winter might keep a star maiden cool in the summer. So when the time came for the seven sisters to once again depart, the youngest remained behind. But to keep from melting away, she had to stay in the ground, in the dark. She doesn't look very happy, guys. That doesn't look like a happy camper. Well, our star-crossed lovers found more woes, for Ihia's embrace continued to melt the maiden, and she was obliged to spend her nights alone in the dark. All of her life, she had known only the company of other stars, and she felt so alone. She cried, and those salty tears flowed down between the layers of the straw, making them freeze over once again. During the hot summer months, she cried a lot. Now, if you've ever spent a winter far enough north, you may have heard the sound of ice crying. It can be quite unsettling on a cold, dark night. Some say that the great spirit heard, heard the crying and came to have a look. It, you're a sky spirit, said the great spirit, and you cannot go on existing like this. <clears throat> Just as an aside, anybody in the audience have a guess as to what the man actually made whenever he dug out the side of the hill, lined it with Locust wood that doesn't rot away easily can be used in outdoor applications for years and years and years. It's very strong. Sealed that with pitch to make it watertight and then rebuilt the hill. What did he make? Anybody have any guesses? <clears throat> Here's the point where the stories diverge. And some say the great spirit transformed the seventh sister into a human woman so that she could properly marry the man that she loved. And others are saying, that the giant, you remember the giant whose feathers were stolen, heard the weeping and uncovered her hiding place. And in this version, the giant possesses the power to transform spirits. And he turns her into a human as punishment for stealing. And he declares that she will now suffer the cold, 
that the sky people bring with them when they rest here, hiding from me. That's what he says. Anyway, no matter which version of the tale that one was heard, no matter which version of the tale one is heard, they all converge back at the wedding. Of course there would be dancing, and that brought the first concern for the upcoming nuptials. It had been decided that with a wedding of such importance, all of the humans should be allowed to attend. But the terrible force of the sisters dancing had everyone terrified. The great spirit intervened, bestowing his gift to the newlywed couple. He dug a hole between a hazelnut tree and a castor bean bush and planted a seed. A vining plant grew up from that place, and it had beautiful white flowers, just like the feathers in the maiden's cloak. In time, the gourd grew to be big enough for all the people to make a hole and walk inside, safe from the storms that came with the sister's dance. And so, here we have an image of a cave, and we're looking out of the cave, safe inside, of course. This may be a, a common memory for a lot of us. Now, this would not be a good story unless the trickster makes an appearance. And you guys know the trickster. He appears in myths and legends all across the world and takes on a number of different guises. Sometimes the coyote is one of his guises that's, that's popular here in the West, but he does take on other forms in other places. In any case, he makes his appearance. And when he does, he places some kind of a pithy film inside the gourd. So that as soon as all the people have walked in, they become stuck fast and they can't move. At this moment, the sisters arrive, and they have brought their shells with them. And this is where I think the mounds of shells version early in the story makes more sense. Because a gourd large enough to hold all of humanity would have to be very, very large. And to do what the sisters did then would take a lot of shells. So the sisters dump their shells out into the gourd. One, two, three, four, five, six, all seven of them. And then they began to dance. Whipping those shells about, scraping and abrading away all of the pith. I'm probably making too much noise with this. So the shells amazingly didn't harm the people, just cleaned them off. So that when everyone emerged, the bits of old pith just fell away like dust in the breeze. And of course... You'll notice that the treatment, I don't know if you can see that from, from here. Let me make a, an adjustment to the camera here. And, of course, you'll notice that when, whenever we do this, oh, I don't know if we can put, get there. The seeds have all been cleaned off perfectly. There is none of that pith or film attached to them. All the pith and all the film inside the gourd cleaned out by the shells, which have this nice abrasive surface on the outside edge, kind of like a rasp. And they have a nice scraping edge here so whenever they tumble inside the gourd and it only takes a few of them working they scrape all of the inside of the gourd out very very rapidly and they clean up the seeds but they aren't abrasive enough to actually damage the seed as a matter of fact later on when we go to plant these seeds we'll probably want to put a nick in the seed coat just so they can absorb water enough to get germinated a little bit more reliably so where were we oh yes the dance. The people were unharmed. All right. Before taking their leave, the six remaining star sisters each left behind a gift for the newlywed couple. They left corn, beans, squash, sunflowers, sunchokes, and ground cherries. You'd be surprised. That particular list I got from a tribe up in Maine. And it is very, very similar to the list of, of common staples that would be grown by woodland and coastal tribes all along the east coast of the United States everywhere. So if you if you heard something familiar, went, hey, that sounds like something that, that my tribe would do, or that sounds like a story that I've heard, keep in mind, I've put together this particular story taking bits and pieces of a great number of stories and bringing them together and cobbling one together. It's a little bit more specific for here in Oklahoma. It fits perfectly, and that's the cool thing, but we haven't got there yet. So, I would love to tell you that the married couple lived happily ever after, but there's more to the story yet. 
This was the time before the creatures of the earth had met in council to voice their concerns about man, before Bear tried to make a bow, and before the Great Spirit had gifted mankind with Datsina, the sacred cedar. The vine Boromoth heard about the wedding and decided to interfere, fearing how powerful humans might become now that they had an alliance with the people from the sky. Chances are, if you've been walking in a vegetable garden during the daytime, you've seen Vine Borer Moth. She's brightly colored, orange and black, and is one of the few moths that are active in the day. It's her habit to lay her eggs on the vines of squash and gourd plants, near to the base of the plant as possible. When the eggs hatch, the larvae will eat their way through the vine, killing the plant. And she was on her way to the wedding celebration to do just that. But she could not find the huge gourd that the Great Spirit had planted. Her keen sense of smell could locate a squash vine for two days' walk in any direction. But she couldn't smell this vine. She tried looking for the gourd. Her eyesight, it's not so good. But she can tell the yellow bloom of a squash flower from a long, long distance away. Still, she didn't see any yellow blooms. And it being daytime, the white blooms of the great gourd were closed. Now, a great war was coming between the humans and the insects, and it's one that would involve all of the other animals as well. But that's a story for another time. For now, I just want to take notice that Vine Boromoth acted out of ignorance and fear, and to be careful not to be guilty of the same error. Vine Borer has a real purpose, and it's a valuable one, too. I want you to imagine for a moment all of the curcubits, the summer squashes, the winter squashes, pumpkins, vines, gourds. They grow these long, strong vines with little tendrils, lots of them, that let them grab onto anything. And if it's not strong enough to hold their weight, they'll drag it down to the ground where their broad leaves hide everything from the sun. Left unchecked, these plants could take over huge areas. So vine borer does a great service for everyone when she's behaving according to her nature. Don't ask me who drew these petroglyphs. I have no idea. <laughs> As for the star maiden and the human, they lived happily. <clears throat> pardon me. They lived happily together for many years and had many children. And their children grew up learning how to grow the small white bulbs that were the alliums. They learned to plant the garlic when the sisters appear in the sky every year in the autumn. They learned to grow the corn, bean, and squash. The sunflowers that make the seeds that are good for both men and birds. And the sunflowers that make edible tubers. They learned how to grow the ground cherries. And of all these things, and all of these things still grow in the remaining woodlands and among the coasts, along the coast where the people once lived. The shell mounds are there too, and some of them are big enough to be seen from far, far above, like up in space. Eventually, Ikea grew old and died, and for a long time it was thought that the Star Maiden had also passed away, until some men built a machine that allows them to see the stars better. And now we know that she did not die, but returned to the sky to be with her people. But since the giant is still chasing the seven sisters, she just hides among the hills and hills and mountaintops. And that's where you're going to be able to, and that's where you need to be in order to see her today, even with one of those machines. Let me pause the story and talk about the, uh, the, the, the actual, um, what is it, astronomy going on. So maybe 100,000 years ago, if one were to look in, in and around the constellation of Taurus, which is where you find the, the star group called the Pleiades, you would have seen sever, seven separate stars, and you would have called those the seven sisters, perhaps. However, because of the movement of the stars relative to other bodies in the heavens, there's a star called Atlas that's a lot brighter. And one of those stars, the, the one that we call Pleon or Pleione, has moved. This is probably better if I do it this way. Yeah, let's do it this way. So one of the stars has moved relative to, to Atlas' position. So Atlas and Pleione are now sort of overlapping in our view, and you can't make out the fact that it's two separate stars unless you have specialized equipment and a lot of clear view to be able to see them. So she's still there, just we can't see her anymore. And the point that she disappeared was somewhere between that 100,000 and 14,000 years ago. And that's why we have these stories about how there were seven sisters and somebody, usually a human, captures her and takes her home to be his wife. And now there's only six. This story is actually fairly common. And it's old, old, old. Okay. 
So now, moving moving back to the story. A long time passed, and eventually the children of Ihia and the Star Maiden had to move to a new place where the land was strange and the familiar plants struggled to grow. The situation was not helpless, although it may have seemed so at first. In time, this new land revealed its gifts to the children of Ihia, and the alliance with the stars held true. And this is the cool part. Just as the sisters leave the sky every year, right around April 15th, here in Oklahoma, most danger of frost will have passed, and it is a good time for planting corn. The children of Ahia still keep the river cane and grow the alliums, corn, beans, squash, sunflowers and ground cherries, or tomatillas where they can, cherry tomato and other tomatoes where they can. There never was another great gourd like the one that had been planted for the wedding. But the children of Ahia took the seeds with them too, and those gourds still provide protection for the harvest once they've been properly prepared. Would you like to see one? They will not decay, and they will even keep rodents from attacking the stores within so long as they're properly kept. Of course, all of that story, oh, hang on, I'll show you this in a minute. Of course, all of that story will have to wait for another time when we dabble in some simple chemistry, use fire to preserve wood, and meet a very poisonous plant, but one that's also a great ally. Until then, may your feet stay dry and your hearth stay warm. And that is the story that I concocted when I thought of what I might come up with in the way of a teaching story. And hopefully you guys listening in heard some of the motifs and the things and, and, and may have picked up on some of the vein of the story. Of course, we're talking about the importance of paying attention to our are our signs. If you don't have a calendar for some reason, say we just we do get knocked back to the Stone Age. Now that we know where to look and see the Pleiades, and we know that they're useful for telling certain things agriculturally speaking. Whenever they arrive, we know it's a good time for us to put our garlic into the ground. So we plant our, our, our cloves of garlic when they appear in the sky. That's that's around October or so they start to show up. Whenever Orion appears, they'll be chased, you know, they'll be running ahead of Orion. So look for Orion, follow his belt at an angle upwards, and you'll find that star cluster, the seven sisters. So they're running away from Orion. He's chasing them in some of the stories. Um, whenever they appear, this is the time to put your garlic in. And whenever they disappear here in Oklahoma, it's different in other places, but whenever they disappear in Oklahoma, that is the signal. Take the gifts that we left for you. For example, the corn. It's now the time to begin planting. And of course, the gourd continues to protect the harvest and prevent it from spoiling. And it can even prevent the rodents, rats, and the mice from coming in and getting the harvest. And you're thinking, how is it possible? This is just a, 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 a regular birdhouse gourd you grew that on a vine can you guys see this i'm not a really great artist okay this is this is just very very basically done but we start with the gourd we get it clean you notice it has all the spots on it and everything that's okay it's got this this little outer skin that has those spots on it most of the gourd is just a hard woody material and it doesn't have that issue so i guess i'll go ahead and tell you how we how, how we go about preparing these i have an entire video that we'll be doing where we show the entire process. And I'll probably run some workshops and stuff like that eventually. Uh, I need to talk to you about some other things, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, once we've got the, the inside cleared out, we've got all the all the little stuff taken out of there. What we want to do is we'll take this and we'll leach some hardwood ash so we have a really, really heavy alkaline solution. I mean, thick enough you can float an egg in it. And then immense the entire, the entire pot or gourd in this case, bowl if you're going to be making a bowl, whatever it is you're making out of it, you immerse, immerse the entire thing into that solution, let it soak. And let it soak very, 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 very well. Whenever it comes out, you can begin taking either your fingernails to scrape it, you could take a, a shell and use a shell to scrape it or whatever you've got. Sometimes just rubbing it with a piece of hide will do the trick because the skin was already ready to just come peeling right off. So it's very, very easy to remove. Now, this treatment also will do a couple things. One, it will lighten up the gourd just a little bit. If there was any mold beginning to form, it's going to kill that off completely. And 
one other thing happens whenever you soak cellulose in a alkaline solution. It alters the nature of the material so that the next time it's exposed to flame, it doesn't burn, but it smolders. And that's important because this is very, 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 very thin. It's a very, very thin wooden shell. And if you burn it, you're going to burn a hole right through it. So the next thing that we do is we go ahead and build a fire. And you could use locust wood if you want to. Uh, but you build a fire and then break it down into small embers and coals and take that, that gourd and toss it in there, put, break the coals over it, give it a quick rotation, and pull it back out. Now, whenever you do, there should be just enough time for the outside to get lightly charred. You don't want it to catch on fire, but lightly charred. And what this does is it turns a portion of that wood to pure carbon. And pure carbon does not rot. So as a result of that treatment, which I did with, with this particular gourd, I have a gourd which has an interesting mottled pattern to it. And it also won't rot. It won't decay. Now, after that's been done and it's cool enough to handle, you're going to take a lot, a lot of fine grit, dust, whatever you've got, or you can sift ashes and use those just to polish down the outside and knock off any soot, you know, black soot that's on there. And you're going to be left with a gourd that looks a little bit like this. And then you start rubbing oil into it. The oil that you use uh, makes a difference. <laughs> Remember the story when I said that the Great Spirit had planted this gourd between a hazelnut, which it used for a trellis to grow up, and you can do in your own gardens. You can actually use use any of your trees to grow one of these gourds or multiple of these gourds. They are very, very useful. But the Great Spirit had planted between a castor bean bush and the hazelnut tree. And the castor bean, although we didn't talk about it, features in the story as well. Because you see, whenever you get the oil from the castor bean, and you use that to rub into your gourd, I can... Uh, also take the, the lid, I treated it as well, and attach a little rubber or more appropriately, a little leather ring here so that it seals the top of the jar. And now this jar sealed so the bugs can't get into it and smelling very, very, very strongly on the outside of castor oil causes, and if these are on a shelf especially, like a bunch of them, the scent of the castor oil causes an asphyxiation effect in rodents. So whenever they're around it, they find it difficult to breathe. And since they find it hard to breathe, they get very, very uncomfortable. And unless they absolutely have to be there, they'll go away. They don't want to hang around this. So the oil gives it a nice shiny appearance. It's not oily to the touch. It's nice and dry to the touch. But it helps establish that nice polish and also the scent of the oil now transforms the nature of the gourd from being just a simple flim flimsy little wooden thing into an actual really decent protection device that you can create an infinite supply of as long as you remember your seven sisters and always have these seeds ready to provide your own supply of containers so Adding to our great list of survival crops, as you may have guessed, we do have on our website now the seeds for the birdhouse gourd, this particular gourd. And I put them in groups of 24 seeds at $3.50. $3.50 is what Baker Creek is charging for the same thing for 20 seeds. So I give you four more seeds than Baker Creek. That's fair. So <laughs> that's what we've got. Um Vicky is asking how we would extract the oils from the castor. Okay, so yeah, the, the, the oil has to be extracted from the uh, from from the castor bean. Castor beans don't grow on trees; they grow on bushes. It's a little bush. It's, uh, you, you can plant them and grow them as annuals in most of the most parts of the country. Some of them produce very very pretty flowers, and they're very interesting garden plants. But they are poisonous. Pardon me. Uh, one of the most dangerous poisons that, that is known to man is manufactured from castor beans. The good news is the poison is not fat-soluble, 
So whenever you press the oil from the beans, the oil does not contain any ricin in it and is perfectly safe. It may not smell or taste very good to us, but it is perfectly safe. Now, I would use a separate oil press to, to, to press the, uh, the, the castor beans to get the oil. If I did not have an oil press and I had to do it the, the really, 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 really old-fashioned way, then I would want to get a, um, a leather bag that I had already pretty much used up and wasn't going to get much use of out, of out of in the future anyway, other than doing this task. Uh, I would go ahead and, and make sure that it was still you know, capable of holding water. Uh, stack my stones up to make, to make a, a, a basically the pot for it, put it in there with a hoop to hold it open as one does, and then fill it full of water, heat stones up in the, in the fire nearby and pick them up with a, with a pair of rock or a pair of, a, of, of sticks to drop them into the bag full of water until the water boiled. It's very simple. While we're doing that, hopefully I've got a, a helper over here that's taking a mortar and pestle that is not going to be used for anything else and is crushing up those beans and crushing them up and crushing them up. Once they've been crushed up, we toss them into that boiling water and then we back off and we let nature do its thing. It'll oil extract, the heat will extract as much of the oil as possible. It'll rise to the surface and it can be skimmed off with a ladle, oddly enough, made out of a birdhouse gourd. This castor oil, of course, can be kept inside of a birdhouse gourd. <laughs> And used, of course, to preserve and treat additional burnt house gourds in the future so that the rodents don't want to hang around them. And that's that's how you you grow an infant supply of storage jars that you can keep the bugs and critters from getting into. It's pretty cool. There are so many useful common household utensils that can be made with birdhouse gourds. <sighs> and Vicky is saying similar process used. Yeah, you you, you can you can you, you can remove the uh, the oil from sunflowers in a similar fashion. Just macerate them, throw them in hot water. It's not as as efficient as using an oil press, but if that's all you've got, you can extract uh, seed and nut oils this way. I thought peyote was a cactus, never seen a gourd. <laughs> All right. So our uh, our story here, of course, is it's about the gourd. It's about the usefulness of, of, of several distinct crops. I hope you noticed those. We've got, of course, the black locust wood, which is great wood for building with. If it's going to be anything, it's going to be exposed to the elements, especially if it's going to be buried. So if you're using it for... Uh, for reinforcing uh, lodges where you're going to be using a lot of earth shelter, which is a very smart thing to do if you want to be able to keep yourself warm in the winter or cool in the summer, if you follow that motif. If you wanted to build an ice house, like, of course, is what our, our hero Hia did, building an ice house and taking that ice in the winter and putting it in the house, ice house, sealing it up in the dark so it won't melt away. But, of course, she's trapped in the dark and she cries. And, of course, whenever the ice begins to, to melt, it refreezes. And that's how you keep your ice cold through the summer. But, of course, you couldn't live in the house with, 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 her, with her man until she was turned human. <laughs> so we've got the, uh, the, the, the signs that are given to us by the sky people, the signs in the heavens that tell us when it's time to, to sow and when it's time to to shift from one activity to another, and sometimes signs that tell us whenever great events and great cycles are on the verge or on the cusp of repeating. Hopefully, we learn the signs, and hopefully, we remember to keep the white bulbs planted by our kitchen door, to always have some of birdhouse gourd growing. Oh, incidentally, another thing about the birdhouse gourd. If you pick it whenever it's green before it turns this, this brownish color, while it's still green, you can treat it like a summer squash. Just remove the pith around the seeds because remember, where did the pith come from? Anybody? Class, where did the pith come from? That's right, the trickster put it in there. So although 
it's there in the gourd, and the gourd is food. The pith is not food because the trickster put it in there. So being not food, it makes you throw up. So if you ever have need to remove something bad for you from your stomach quickly and you happen to have birdhouse gourd growing nearby, you can scoop out the pith, consume the pith, and very quickly whatever is on your stomach that is causing you to be ill will no longer be in your stomach. And that will hopefully uh, be something you never have to use, but it's a good piece of information to have. So throw away the pith or <laughs> if you're feeling adventurous, keep a little bit of it around just in case. Of course, the children of Ahia grow the river cane, and they grow the corn, the squash, the beans, uh, sunflowers, the sunchokes, and the ground cherries, which are sweet and delicious and worth it if you can get them to start and grow wherever you're at. Uh, I've, I've got another round of Hanover ground cherries I'm going to try to get started here. But I've got tomatoes as a fallback. I've got the brandywine tomatoes that are perfectly perfect as a as a vining uh, tomato plant. So I can grow those. They're, they're perfectly fine. But I do love those ground cherries. They're so tasty. Vicky was wanting to know if, if, if it's as good as Ipecac. And I do not know. I, I, I've, I've never had the need for it. But I can tell you from smelling that the smell that, that the vines have, if you put your nose next to it, it's an odd smell. And actually, it's not an unusual smell uh, if, if you think about the way a castor bean smells. Because there is a little tiny hint of that something isn't quite right here <laughs> smell to it that makes you go, I'm not touching it. I'm not touching it. <laughs> but it's, it's perfectly safe to eat. Um so Joe's Joe's down there saying, didn't know that, that, that the gourds could be eaten whenever they're green. Yeah, they're 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 like they're like a calabash. Joe, they're like this like calabash. Like just just like you you go to the market and grab a calabash, that's that's it. It's pretty much the same gourd, just a different uh just a different breed of it that they grow for for calabash gourd for, for the for the market. So they're growing the same type of gourd. And selling them in the markets of Mexico, I know you can get them right now. Like, well, maybe not right now, but in the morning you can walk out there and grab some. And all they are is that immature form of what will eventually be a gourd, kind of like this one, or like a lufa. Yeah, lufa is also whenever it's green you can eat it, but when, once that once the seeds have matured, you don't want to eat them. They'll they'll make you sick, sick, sick. Hmm. Heterodox saying any use for last year's miscanthus sauce it's like bamboo, just smaller. Well, sometimes if you've got really good hard, hard woody stuff, you might consider using it to make biochar. That would be a good use for it. Possibly, maybe. Of course, you get your shells and oh, using shells to make the hole that you need in the gourd actually works pretty well. They've got a fairly sharp ridge right there, and if you hold them between your thumb and your forefinger, you've got a pretty effective little cutting tool that you can use to saw your way, and you can rotate it like that. And it just scrapes out a perfectly round little hole for you. It's pretty cool. <laughs> and good night, Miss Calabash, wherever you are, from Jimmy Durante. Yeah, Mary's on the road, unfortunately, so she was not able to join us tonight. So that's it. That's our show. Woohoo! Hey, I got done early. Wow. But I needed to talk to you guys about a couple of things. First off, what do you think? Uh, I, I, I think I saw a couple of people, some people say earlier go for it. But I was like, yeah, I know. I really want to go. It's it's an old mogi. It's it's gonna be day trip. I mean, half an hour drive. Not not bad. I can have somebody here. I'd like to have Mary with me whenever I go because it'd be it'd be good to to, to have have a uh, a partner in crime. Uh, then the question is, okay, what do I bring with me? Should I bring? I, I I've got a couple ideas. I'm thinking about bringing um, one of the one of the pet tubs that we keep trees in. Go ahead and bring that. Bring it. Bring a bunch of trees. Uh, bring a a five gallon water jug so I can refill the 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 uh, 
the, the pet tub. I'll have to drain it to transport it. Bring that. Maybe I'll bring some daylilies with me. Uh, I may definitely bring some gourds with me and some gourd seeds and things like that. And I was thinking about just sitting down to, with the kids and talking to them about how to how to start up a business like what I'm running. It is, it is a simple startup to do if you were a child at home and had free time. Uh, if you don't have free time, it's not a great business to start up because it's it's there's a lot of there's a lot of things that you have to do to get to the point where you can actually start selling, and you aren't making any money up to that point. Uh, let's see. Light green, almost yellow, green speckles. The interior is like spaghetti squash, black seas. No, I, 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 I don't know if we have them up here, but I haven't grown them. I have not grown them, so I do not know. Anyway, that's what we got. And I got new plants coming in. I planted a whole bunch of them earlier today. And I got to do some more planting tomorrow, oh joy. Uh, I got to move some more rocks around and stuff like that. This little thing right here, I don't know. Maybe I should turn, just turn off the green screen so you can see it right. That's what we'll do. That's, let's go to the... Um, what was it doing? Oh, I, I guess I could just fade it completely, right? There we go. Oh. Is that it? Let's see. It didn't go away? Oh, shoot. Let's see if I can. All right. Nope. All right. Sorry. Virtual background says what? I just want to turn it off, please. Thank you. All right. There we go. We'll do it that way. I'll just change the background color and it won't be on. All right. So now, now it's now it's trying to remove all the blues. So there we go. Let me show you that picture there with its own colors. There's. It looks like a regular oxalis, guys, right? But this one's called oxalis tuberosa, and the common name for oxalis tuberosa is oka. So this is a a little ground cover plant, oxalis tuberosa. It looks like a regular wood sorrel, right? Looks exactly like a regular wood sorrel. But down here, yeah, if I, if I have the green screen on and I hold it up in front of me because I have a green background on the green screen behind me, it will show up as green, which is weird. All right. So it looks just like oxalis, but this one has an edible tuber that it grows. So whenever it spreads, this little ground cover, I can dig it up, and it's got a high-calorie edible tuber that it makes. So that's kind of exciting to see if I can get this to spread. And this one here that's just barely peeking out is Lovage. You can see what those leaves look like. This bush at full size will be about six foot tall. It gets big. And these packages were, were heavy. I, I I think if I ever get to the point where I'm shipping uh, Aka or Oka, Aka, however you pronounce it, if I ever get to the point where I ship it, I am only going to ship it during its dormant season. I don't want to have to. I don't want to have to ship dirt. So anyway, just let me know. Oh shoot! No, I'm throwing things. I can always keep the tubers packed away in some grass or something inside a gourd or something. Who knows? <laughs> Put these. Oh, I'm running out of room. There we go. Oh, yeah. The green screen is not as big as you might think. I have to pull it up really close to me, otherwise it disappears. So yeah, Vicky said, uh, "Seen Oka okay, for sale for One Green World." I, yeah, I, I can't. I, where did I get these? Uh, Strictly medicinal is the place where I got it from. But yeah, I think I've seen seen them at One Green World as well. And Heather is saying, "Lovage is an annual. Lovage is a wonderful perennial herb." Um, although it's kind of disturbing that it's an annual where you're growing. <laughs> but if you can grow it as a perennial, it has the taste of celery. Uh, even more so than celery. It tastes more like celery than celery does. And so you can use it in place of celery and recipes that call for celery. And so if you have lovage and you have the other plant that Sean from Edible Acres is shipping to me, it just shipped today. So it'll be here sometime this week, hopefully. Uh, the other plant is Bunais officinalis or Turkish wordy cabbage or the 
nicer name, Turkish Rocket, which is really like a perennial broccoli in all actuality. So we're going to have a perennial broccoli. We're going to have have a, a, a perennial celery. We already have perennial onions. We've got a variety of other perennial starch tubers. So we throw all this stuff together, and by golly, we've got stir fry, and it's all perennial, and you just go pick it whenever you're hungry. I like gardening this way. I think it's the way we should garden. I think it's the way we probably started gardening, and we got away from that at some point. It would be good for us to get back to it. Um, Joe's asking, the plant that I have, um, yeah, it's oxalis with edible tubers is what it is. And then Lovage is this tiny little one right here. Get a little close look at the celery-like leaves. That's it, It's a perennial that tastes like celery and gets huge. It, 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 one, one plant should be enough to supply a household. We have six. <laughs> so I'm definitely, definitely, definitely going to make sure at least one of them survives somewhere around here and I can start getting... Some, some propagules off it. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Uh, I want to save some of them. Well, I didn't I didn't list as many as I have. I, I only put like 20 packets up there, and that leaves me plenty to plant more and plenty to uh, to pass out to the kids whenever uh, whenever I go. I think I will be going on the 5th of May. So here you know. Here you go. On the 5th of May, I think I will be going and attending the, uh, the event. Because although although my uh, my tribal ancestors from back east were Chaliki, and they live next to the Muskiki. Um, as far as I'm concerned, keeping all of the, the eastern woodland cultures alive in any way we can, and getting the kids involved in uh, in becoming horticultural again, I think is is important. I think we should all be heading that direction. If we can share culture in that way, uh, we can we can make some positive change for the world. All right. Oh, Mary's Mary's still here. She's just getting ready for bed. Hey, me too. It's about that time. We're winding down. So those are the plants that we just got in. Uh, I've got to get back out there and get back to work again tomorrow. Um, we've got two weeks until it's time to get our corn in because in two weeks' time, the seven sisters will be departing and will no longer be visible from planet Earth until it's time to plant our garlic again. So, uh, oh yeah, the one other thing I wanted to talk about, and it, it relates to, it relates to the event. Now, I'll be showing and just volunteering my time. I'm not going to get paid for showing up or anything, but the thought occurred to me that maybe I should establish what my base rate is for doing stuff like this because if I get the opportunity to again serve serve a community or serve my community or serve any community really i can volunteer my time and since i have an established rate i know what i'm writing off for tax purposes so guys what do you think what should i charge for for for, for uh for, for a one-day appearance is 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 there is there a base rate for that what should, <laughs> should should i consider doing this okay i'm gonna i'm gonna charge a certain amount like maybe five hundred dollars to 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 show up and, and and talk. Assuming this is, I'll need to talk for a grand total of of one hour. It's five hundred dollars plus expenses, like travel expenses or, or something like that, hotel and airfare, whatever it is. I, I need to have that established ahead of time. So it's an already established fact that I charge speaking fees. So whenever I do an event that's charitable and I waive any appearance fees, I, I'll have an amount already established and I'm just not making it up. You know, I'm, I'm just going to make up a number for tax purposes here. I'm going to charge $500,000 for speaking fees and I didn't charge any. So that's a value of $500,000 donated to charity. Blah. Look, see, I owe no taxes. I mean, fair enough as far as I'm concerned, but I don't think I could probably get away with that unless I already had it. Um, Yeah, there's a database for speakers. I had to check it out and see. Um, I don't 
Well, at this particular event, I wouldn't be asking for donations at all. I, I just wanted to know what what my what my fee would be if I was charging. That way, if I want to write off appearances for for, for tax purposes, I can donate time and be doing something positive for for the for the greater community as a whole and not get robbed at the same time. And I think that's a great way to work it. It's like, look, I'm going to go over here and do this charitable demonstration, teaching a whole bunch of people how they can grow a lot more food for them and take better care of the planet. It's a charitable thing, and you can write it off. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about that. He was talking about an event that he's doing, I think, this week, but it's out there in Alabama. I'm not going to be able to get out there. Unless your name is Obama. <laughs> oh, yeah. Of course, what some of these people were doing was not really selling the public speaking. You know, if the Clintons are going to show up and you're going to make a $200,000 to the Clinton Foundation for the Clintons showing up. Oh, wow. Look, it's a charitable donation. <laughs> yeah. That was just buying access. There you go. Yeah, definitely have to keep track of the expenses because it's 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 kind of iffy. I I wouldn't want to go. Well, I, I attended one charity event, it's the only speaking event I did, and I'm going to charge blah 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 blah. But I waive it, so I, I write it off my taxes. It, it looks fishy, but yeah, yeah, I probably should. I've got a I've got an email David about some other stuff anyway, so I may as well. It's like, oh hey, I'm going to talk to you about this. Um, turns out people actually want me to show up and teach. Um, <laughs> Yay! It's a step in the right direction. Uh, eventually, I, I do want to 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 uh, to connect with local schools and stuff like that. And get involved with the with the kids, getting the kids that are in in the school system right now something that they can do, something that they can look forward to. Because uh, futures look bleak out there. <laughs> if you're if you're not sitting where I am at, future looks bleak. But where I'm sitting, I see nothing but opportunities, and it, it would be great for 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 someone to be able to to put that that mindset in front of young minds and people that have the energy to get out there and do a lot more than I'm capable of doing. And uh, I think, uh, shoot, I think the next crop of kids we teach them right are going to be great. That's what I think. Anyway, thank you very much for joining me tonight. Um, if, if anybody's watching on replay and you have some thoughts about, you know, what should I charge for speaking engagement? Should I charge for consultation fees? I, I, I have never been certified, uh, as a permaculture designer by any buddy that administers the test. But then again, you know, Hippocrates was never board certified either. Guys, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. As always, you know what to do. Get out there and get growing, and I will catch you next time. Good night.